Hybrid fish may be rare in the reef tank hobby, but it turns out they're not all that rare on wild coral reefs. These hybrid fish sell for huge amounts of money when they're available, like this hybrid between an Achilles tang and a white cheek tang that sold for $1,300 recently on Live Aquarius Diver's Den website. In the wild, hybrids are relatively common on the border where two species meet. For instance, nearly 50% of the species in Pomacanthidae, the large marine angelfish, are involved in hybridization today, and nearly 40% of butterfly fish species are also involved in hybridization. Hi guys and girls, I'm Reef Ben, and today we're talking about a paper titled Hybridization and the Evolution of Coral Reef Biodiversity. It was published in Coral Reefs, and if you'd like to check it out, there is a link down below. Take a moment to subscribe if you like this sort of content. There's a lot more coming, about once a week or so. Okay, first off, it will be useful to know that we organize animals into trees called clades. So what is a clade? Very simply, it's the tree of species that we can trace back to a common ancestor. As fish, coral, even sharks and sea snakes interbreed, they form hybrids. Sometimes, if conditions are just right, that hybrid can go on to form an entirely new species, a new branch in the same clade as its parents, and the tree grows a little bit deeper. How do we actually detect hybrids? Well, it turns out this isn't so easy, particularly in the oceans. We know a lot more about hybrids of freshwater fish, and certainly a lot more about hybrid plants and land animals. As we study more and more of the world's coral reefs, collecting genetic information as we do so, we're finding more and more hybrids in the oceans as well. Sometimes it's as simple as looking at the fish. Sometimes it's clear that this individual is a mix of two parent species. Sometimes it's not so easy though. Hybrids can interbreed back with their parent species and they can look identical to their parents. In those cases, unless we've studied the genetics of that individual fish, it's hard to know that we're looking at a hybrid. You might have hybrid fish or even coral in your reef tank today and not even know it. Hybrid fish are most commonly found at the border between the range of two different species, particularly where the density of fish from those two species is low and where both those species are similar. The science of hybrid reef animals is really just in its infancy, and the number of genetic studies we have available to look at to find these hybrids is easily less than 500. It's not really that surprising to me that we found the most hybrids on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and in the Indonesian coral reefs. These are probably amongst the world's most well-studied reefs. Hybrids occurring at the borders between two similar species have a strong effect on the overall evolution of those species. When hybrids make their way back deeper into their parent species ranges, that impact is made even more broad as the genetic information from the other species is spread into the parent's genome. Hybridization is actually a big driver of the incredible diversity that we see on coral reefs around the world today. In fact, hybrids do happen in coral as well. And amongst those, we know of 281 species that form hybrids in Acroboridae alone. That's about 15% of the total species in that family. Corals don't form hybrids only where the species ranges meets, like the fish often do though. Hybrids are much more widely distributed in coral versus fish, and we think that this is just due to how corals reproduce, where gametes are just broadcast up into the water, and they drift about, and hopefully they settle out and create a new coral. Because most coral reef fish, and certainly all the coral I know of, have a free-swimming larval stage of life, ocean currents can transport them far from their birthplaces. Changes in ocean currents like that can introduce new individuals to places where they might be likely to hybridize with other species. This means that the prevalence of hybrid animals can change over time as the ocean itself changes. If the density of those hybrids gets to be high enough that they begin to breed amongst themselves, we can even get a new species there. Corals normally have high levels of genetic information overlapping between species, but we don't see as many hybrid corals as we might expect because of something called introgressive hybridization. Introgressive hybridization is just a big fancy term for what happens when a hybrid animal is born, but then it breeds back with one of its parent species enough that it can't form a stable hybrid population. This is why it's useful to have low densities of both parent species if you do want a hybrid population to establish as a new species. 
You want the hybrids themselves to breed rather than mixing back into the parent populations. Interbreeding groups of coral and fish over thousands and thousands of years can form species complexes. Think about the fairy wrasses or deepwater butterfly fish like Chitidon tinkeri. As these groups of fish interbreed, new closely related species arise over time. Because those resulting species are so closely related, we group them into a species complex, which makes studying them easier. As the world's climate changes and the ecological niches available to fish and coral change with it, we can expect new hybrids to be created. From the paper, take the example of clownfish. Many species of clownfish are found primarily in one specific species of anemone in the wild. As the climate changes, the overall number of anemones will decrease, eventually forcing two different species of clownfish into the same anemone. This close contact makes a hybrid clownfish more likely. It's also possible that instead of creating a new hybrid species, the genomes might mix so completely through continued interbreeding that the two parent species merge into just one hybrid species that entirely replaces both parents. This can be a problem for long-term species diversity. From two species, we end up with only one. The reverse can happen as well, though. For instance, if the hybrid is better suited to a particular ecological niche, it might become established there over time, and instead of two species, we're left with three. This group of species might eventually be considered a complex. Introgression, breeding back with the parent species and the mixing of genomes, can give genes that make the resulting hybrids more adaptable in some way. Perhaps one of the parent species of coral is better able to produce protective stress proteins. That's a genetically controlled trait, after all. And perhaps the resulting hybrid would gain this ability as well. Then that hybrid could become its own more hardy species over time. Or perhaps it would interbreed back with the parent species and slowly spread those genes that give better stress tolerance to the parent population. This greater tolerance for heat is actually one of the exciting things that we're seeing in corals today. As the oceans warm, this ability to pass on traits like this is a hopeful sign that perhaps coral reefs will survive if given the chance to adapt to changes over many, many years. We don't always have multiple decades to let this happen naturally, and so we've actually already interbred corals to explore this ability, and some of those are living in the oceans today in test beds. If all goes well, we could create genetic hybrids in the lab and replant them out onto bleached reefs to prevent the overall breakdown of the coral reef ecosystem. I thought this review paper was really pretty cool. It's not open access, but I'm sure if you contacted the authors or maybe looked around in libraries, you might be able to find it to read. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please take a moment to subscribe. Stay safe, be kind to each other, and have a fantastic day. Bye.